Hi guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast show. I'm Kune, your host, and this is the podcast dedicated to rapid growth in online retail. I'm just going to draw my mic here so um, my audio guy, you know, does not get upset. But, you know, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. And um, if you're looking to grow metrics such as conversions, average order value, traffic and automate these sales, you're, you're in the right show. On today's show, um, I, I, I'd i like to... Uh, today, who's, who's, who's coming from today's show? He's, he's a gentleman by the name of Eugene Levine, and he's a chief strategist officer at um, SEM Rush. Now, there's a chance that 80% of you guys listening know or have come across SEM Rush because of how you know, um, how dominant they are in, in the SEO space. Um, I used SEM Rush back in 2010, I think. And, um, I've just seen it grow, you know, astronomically it's, it's become the gold standard essentially for keyword research in, um, and also now SEO audits in, um, in the, in, in the, in the, in the SEO world. Um, and I was actually, you know, um, on a YouTube tutorial, I attended a course on, on YouTube and, you know, optimizing YouTube channels because we just set up the YouTube channel. And um, one of the go-to, um, you know, um, platforms uh, alongside, I think it was like Telebody, was SEM Rush for keyword research, for, for looking for potential topics in, in titles. Um, the technology is outside. The, you, you'd think SEM Rush was from Google um, a lot of the time because of how deep how they're able to just reverse engineer how Google works. Um, so I, my, it's, it's, it's an absolute privilege to, 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 to have, um, you know, a C-level, you know, rep, uh, C-level leader at SEM Rush on the show. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Eugene Levin. Welcome, Eugene. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Before we kick off today's show, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Did you know that cloud-hosted e-commerce platforms like Shopify and BigCommerce do not provide automatic backups? Rewind steps in to protect Shopify and BigCommerce stores with automatic backups. Rewind is trusted by over 25,000 stores. Install Rewind and get to test it for free over seven days. And to extend the seven-day trial to 30 days, head over to rewind.io, their website, and mention 2x e-commerce. A pleasure, a pleasure, a pleasure. It's you're, you're, you're dialing in from the East Coast right now. Um, is that in, in New York or um, elsewhere? In Boston. In Boston. Oh, well, okay. Boston is is a hub of um, a lot of tech companies. Um, I, I could see. Um, I was in Boston, um, I think, last year, October. Um, so it's pretty early for you there, um, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Um should we should we start out with you giving a brief introduction about yourself, and then um, we'll probably talk about SEM Rush and the state of SEO and, and e-commerce. Sure. So yeah, my background is mostly in venture capital. I used to be partnering two different firms, invested in everything from you know seed stage, early stage to late stage pre-IPO companies. Um, in in my recent firm, we focused on uh, consumer internet marketplaces. You know, I invested in companies like Lyft that you might have heard about. Um, in in Europe, um, our our one of the biggest bets uh, was a company called Delivery Hero, which yet again we invested. We thought it's it's a it's a late stage, but now they're traded at like sixteen billion dollars market cap, mm -hmm. world's biggest food delivery company. Uh, so uh, that was kind of the focus of the firm. And um, at some point, it felt like the, the multiples and, and valuations are hyperinflated. Uh, in, you know, it was the period when everyone was looking for the next Uber of something, you know, mm -hmm. like Uber of, um, Uber of cleaning, Uber of yep. you know, other things. And yeah, everything just felt very expensive. And at the same time, I, I noticed that SaaS companies are undervalued. Um, and trading at, you know, almost all time low multiples for SaaS. And uh, as a result, I thought, you know, we probably should need to focus on, on different segments and just try to find good companies there. Yep. Uh, I, 
and, and we had this approach about investing in things we know. And I used SEMrush probably, you know, like you since 2010, 2011. Uh, you know, sometimes for marketing, but also for due diligence. Because, you know, when, we, when you invest in companies, you want to understand competitive landscape and, and uh, you know, SEMrush uh, competitive intelligence have been one of the core parts of the product pretty much since the very beginning. So I reached out to founders. Uh, we had a conversation. Uh, you know, I very quickly started to realize that this is probably much more successful business than I initially, than I initially thought. Um, but they, you know, they, you know, they were, they were so, so efficient. They didn't need money. So, um, you know, as many investors do in those situations, I just you know, tried to stay in touch, be helpful. I was giving them advice, help to set up analytics frameworks, how, you know, to establish, uh, you know, connections with, with the community. So, so, you know, did, did, you know, some advisory work for free. And uh, eventually we met one more time. I gave them another pitch about the value that investors can bring, uh, you know, on top of the money. Mm -hmm. But they, they said, Eugene, you seem like a, you know, helpful guy, but we still don't need your money. So why don't you just join the company? And, you know, and they kind of made me an offer that was very hard to reject. So, so that was uh, more than four years ago. And uh, yeah, since then we had quite an interesting journey. Um, company, in, you know, grew, I think by now more than six times. So um, it was qu quite, quite an exciting uh, journey. It's, it's been an incredible journey because um, at the time, I remember they were predominantly based in Europe, in, in Russia at the time, back in 2010. And then we started to see like consistent expansion, you know, and, and you could see with the hires, um, they, they were getting more hires um, in London. They were doing lots of um, um, in-person um, events. Um, they were sponsoring a lot of events, also SEO events um, and um yeah, a lot of people were not talking about SEM Rush. They were pushing a lot of other tools, but the feature sets, the the strength, the power of it spoke for itself. I remember I was using another SEO because I I, I used to be an SEO. Um, I was using another SEO, um, and I was pushing this other SEO platform called Analytics SEO, and it was just not as robust and and good um, as as the SEM Rush. And over time. Um, it's so-called, um, you know, SEO audit capabilities um, was just flat, completely obliterated by SEM Rush. I, I, it was, it was fantastic. It was, it's phenomenal. And to see where it, where where it's going now, or where it is now, is 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 is, is super super interesting. So, um, could you sort of, if 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 you have privy to this, um. So let give us a timeline of the last ten years of of SEO and then we we'll start to talk about you know um, more technical bits of, of SEO and um, and e-commerce. So I think the so we 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 believe that birthday is two thousand uh, two thousand eight, uh, but it it kind of started a little bit earlier with the website uh sorry, sorry web browser plugin called SEO Quake. That mm. was one of the most popular um, yeah, on Chrome. SEO, SEO yeah. plugins. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so on Firefox. Um, yep, for Firefox. Now, now, now it's available for almost everything. But yeah, so it started with this plugin. And, um, and that gave us kind of, kind of good reach to SEO community uh, initially. And that you know, reach allowed us to, um, to so, sort of promote new products uh, to this audience. Uh, no, there was there was project called SEO Digger, which then evolved um, into SEM Rush, and um, and I think you know after after two thousand eight, it was pretty much all the way SEM Rush. And we started with two products, um, mostly SEM competitive intelligence products um, for pay per click advertising and search engine optimization. So that's sort of why SEM Rush. Um, uh, because, you know, SEO and pay-per-click AdWords combined, you know, give you SEM. Um, so, and that was the case pretty much all the way till 2012. Uh, and, um, you know, founders didn't really uh, focus all their time on, on this one pretty much till 2012. It was more like a hobby than, than full-time business. 
but you know this thing was growing quite well without a lot of investment you know in terms of money or time so there was something like you know people people liked the product they were sharing it with with you know friends colleagues so it was so one one of those pure organic growth stories like you don't yeah. you just build a product you don't do anything and it grows and and once they they realized um this they decided to you know abandon all other projects and focus on SEM brush exclusively yeah so uh then you know that was roughly 2012 at that point we started uh establishing offices in other countries so so in 2012 we uh opened our office in uh, philadelphia yeah. uh so and um you know after that it was uh you know we started hiring more marketing people more sales people uh but still proportion between you know sales marketing and R&D was not favorable for distribution and favorable for R&D. So majority of company was, at that point was, was just engineering and, and product teams. And uh, we started expanding the product um, as in, you know, new features mostly for SEO and, and sometimes for, for pay-per-click. Uh, and then in 2000. You know, 15, 16, so a so little bit before I joined, uh, we started rapid expansion of the product. So we started uh, building products for social media, for content marketing, um, decided to broaden our competitive intelligence capabilities. And, um, and that's kind of was you know, roughly 2016. And then one of the first things that, that I wanted to change when I joined was how we do our marketing and sales because we were extremely efficient, but for investor, if companies extremely efficient, that's you know, on one side very positive, but on the other side means it could grow faster. And uh, you know, people, people from investment background, they, they kind of you know, focus mostly on speed of growth. And uh, that's, that's sort of what I wanted to do. So we made company in a way less efficient from customer acquisition point of view, but we accelerated growth dramatically. Uh, we started investing in global marketing. We started hiring more and more salespeople. We started expanding our global offices. So right now we have three offices in the United States, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, and Dallas. Uh, we have uh, two offices in Europe. Czech Republic, Cyprus, and uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, we continue to invest in R&D. So R&D is uh, still by far biggest, not, not by far, but it's, it's still biggest part of the organization. Um, so so what, what, does, what does marketing at a SaaS company look like? Um, marketing that stimulates, you know, hockey stick growth, as you just alluded to, look like? I think yeah, a lot of I, th I think if you if you think what's the core difference between e-commerce marketing and and SaaS marketing? So SaaS marketing is, is not very transactional in the way that e-commerce marketing is focused just on you know moving customer through the finish line and that's it. And then if customer doesn't buy again ever, that's not good, but it's to tolerable. So for SaaS, it's not tolerable. So SaaS is is a different beast where. You spend a lot, a lot of money upfront to get, you know, customer attention and then to educate customer and then, you know, maybe, you know, sort of push customer through the finish line. But then it's only the beginning of the journey. Then you need to start working on retention. Then you need to start working on expansion. So uh, it's uh, from, from this point of view, in e-commerce, transaction is, is the end, you know, the final, the final destination. Then, yeah, if you can build relationships, that's great. But that's you know more of a more of a you know uh, additional outcome rather than the, the the goal of the marketing. And then in e-commerce, this is just the beginning. So we just start with with conversion, and then real story begins. And um, in terms of uh, you know channels and, and tactics that you do approaches is also the same. You invest a lot upfront in certain channels in a way you know you're, you 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 earn your reputation, uh, you earn trust in the community. You you know there there are some channels where you invest for years, they don't bring anything, and and then 
at some point they start working. Like uh, you've mentioned, you see us a lot at conferences. Well, conferences, if you, if you just do conference once, doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's just a complete waste of money. Yeah. But if you do them consistently uh, over years, then it helps you to start getting attention from opinion leaders. It, it helps you with some sort of brand recognition. And then when, when you know, client have a choice between you and some other company, and they yeah. remember they've seen you in a conference, that's, that's right. yeah. So, so it's, it's more of a branding exercise and, and relationships and networking than, than marketing channel. But, but if you invest consistently for years, it starts you know, paying off one day. And it's and also the problem with those things, they're very hard to measure. So we, measure. we had we had to come up with ridiculously complicated analytics frameworks to uh, to prove the you know that, that certain things uh, provide value. Or or you know sometimes we, we discover that they don't provide value and we abandon them. But um, I think the, the big difference is that in, in software uh, it's a very, very long term game comparing to e commerce. Okay, so let's. Um, a majority of our listeners um, are, you know, e-commerce businesses, and um, some have an SEO strategy. You know, others don't have an SEO strategy. Um, others are just, you know, working on performance marketing, um, of which your tool is still, you know, relevant in the sense that, um, you know, if you're looking to dissect um, or, um, you know, keyword research on, on Google AdWords, um, you know, this you know, SEM rush provides a lot of insights on top of the Google keyword tool. Now, um, so what suggestions um, do you give, would you give to e-commerce, you know, businesses looking for like competitor intelligence or competitor research or market analysis um, for growth on the one hand and um, for entering new markets on the other? So I think in in terms of growth um, for e-commerce, I think the, the question is uh, how much people already know about your product. So how innovative is it? And I think if, you know, if, if this is, you know, pretty much, you know, let's say another laptop uh, and people know what, a, what, what is laptop, and then, then it's more about listing optimization, which is uh, on page, um, you know, adding, adding right keywords uh, to the text. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, Things like like link building, uh, internal structure. So so that's that would be my key. In terms of keyword research, there are you know not that many creative things you can do with an existing product category like laptop. You want you want to have some some choice of keywords that are um, you know a little bit less competitive than what your competitors are using, but still get a lot of volume. Uh, but over time, there are less and less uh, such options because you know other people do the same thing. Uh, so. So with, with this, it's, it's more about, you know, the, your domain in general, and then how this domain splits sort of link equity to other parts of the website. So you have good internal linking, and then on page for each listing. Um, it's more interesting for new product categories, uh, because there you can do a lot of content around listings, mm-hmm. uh, kind of to teach people what, this thing is about, and um, and here you can come up with some sort of uh, pillar content strategy, which doesn't usually work for e-commerce. But if it's a new product category where you need to, uh, you know, teach people what is it about, uh, that could work. The only the only issue is that if if this is something new, people are not searching for it. So you need to, you know, find some closed topics uh, that that sort of people search for. And then when, 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 when they got to your content, move them to the direction of your uh, product. So, so in terms of keyword research here, you would, you would want to do, for example, things like, uh, you know, gap analysis to identify um, things that other people write about. And then versus this gap analysis uh, run, uh, you know, more or less standard keyword research to identify what, of those keywords have uh, the best opportunity, you know, not very competitive and, and have reasonably high volume. Um, 
but those keywords will not be directly related to your product. They will be from similar topics. Now, close for the same audience, but not exactly this, because you're trying to promote your product category. Um, so, and then in terms of, so, so that was kind of about the growth. And the second question was, moving into new markets as in like yep. seeking new opportunities um, with, with insights um, yep. from, from tools like yours. Yeah. So I think uh, yet again, there are two ways um, to approach this. If you attack an uh, existing market, then you know, you, you can do a lot of uh, competitive research um, and, and kind of, you know, in general, uh, try to understand what niches are not taken. In this case, you're not thinking about each keyword specifically or each product specifically. What you wanna see is uh, what are the e-commerce player, players are less presented in different space. Um, it, and, and it's also about um, you know, local market to some degree. I mean, e-commerce is kind of supposed to be very global play, but I think it's still not the case and in many cases local players with better logistics can win local markets and when i yeah. say local i mean country level yeah. uh, so it's a you know it, for 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 you to to find your niche it doesn't matter what amazon is doing in the united states it's important what are the people doing in your country so so you, you by the way it's one of the ways to to identify good niches might be exactly to see you know, what, what's overlap, let's say, between Amazon and Home Depot. Mm -hmm. So those are probably very popular goods. And then you can identify those goods and do another gap analysis with it versus your local players mm -hmm. and see what Amazon and Home Depot are doing that your local players are not doing. You, you mentioned SEM Rush moving out of, outside of the, well, just expanding outside of the Google um, ecosystem to, to other platforms and social. Um, does that also include Amazon? Do you now provide um, insights into Amazon keyword research? Uh, so, you know, in, term, in terms of Amazon, we, we've launched one product, uh, which is uh, free, uh, free Amazon A-B testing. Okay. One, one of the problems with Amazon that you cannot really run tests. So we build a uh, sort of workflow around this that allows you to test listings. It's not classic A-B tests, more like before and after tests, but still you know, better than, than nothing and product is free. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will be releasing more uh, things for Amazon. We are focusing mostly you know, on two parts. So one is, is how do I improve my rankings within Amazon ecosystem? And then the second one is how do I drive external traffic to Amazon listings? Interesting. Because is we, we think that ultimately people would lean towards owning their audience in some way. Mm -hmm. And then for them, Amazon will be more of a logistics and checkout. Exactly. Um, and uh, that's why we, we think that moving forward, um, you know, sending external traffic to Amazon will be, will be a big, uh, big part. Uh, of your mix mm -hmm. yeah. and it kind of circles back to what you talked about from sem's experience um with the with the conferences so you look at sit a situation in which um you have a product um say you're selling like a phone case and you've done effective marketing from other channels such as facebook or you know even um um you know sponsorship or podcast what, what have you um and people know your brand name and when they're, you, you drive traffic to your Amazon or when they're in Amazon, they look at your brand name um, and they look at another because it's a marketplace. There's so much. Um, if you're looking for a phone case, you have you know thousands of millions of choices. But because of the strength of that brand name, your brand equity, um, they just naturally gravitate um, to, towards your brand in Amazon. And then, you know, what you just said, which I think is golden, no one has ever said it, is the fact that Amazon would be viewed as a checkout. It's, it is just another checkout. Mm. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Clavio is a growth marketing platform that powers over 25,000 online businesses. Clavio understands every single customer interaction and empowers brands to create more personalized marketing moments. Listen, analyze, and act on your customer data with Clavio. Visit clavio.com forward slash 2x.
interesting. It, it, and I think I think many people don't see them this way because um, you know a lot of people made businesses just by selling on Amazon and just managing one yeah. channel and that's it. Now, what we see is that you know moving forward, this will be way more competitive than it is today. So there will be a need for some diversification. So you want you naturally you would want to say okay i'm selling amazon now i want to also start selling walmart i want to start selling on other you know places depending on what country i'm in uh and um and and you know people will will become you know not one channel manager but multiple channel managers but then at some point people will say okay um I sell a lot of stuff. I don't know people who buy it. So, uh, so mm-hmm. it's very hard for me to sort of remarket to them and they mm-hmm. will be going more into direction where they need to build a brand first mm-hmm. and then think about distribution. Once you, once you control and own your audience, then ultimately Amazon is just like logistics and, and delivery. If you're not, <clears throat> if, if you drive more traffic to your listings than they do, then they, they have very low leverage. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. so what, what channels are you, th- what, what, what were your go-to channels for driving traffic to an Amazon listing? Well, I mean, uh, I think, I think, you know, in, in terms of traffic, it's pretty much the same almost for everything. Uh, search traffic is the biggest sor- source of external traffic. Sometimes you have strong brand and and you have a lot of direct traffic, which doesn't really count. This is just a brand awareness and and you know uh, the the function the, the function of your audience. Uh, but yeah, in terms of external traffic, search traffic is by far the best. Um, you know if so. So if can you, wanna, you can you buy um, Google shopping ads or um, you know? Um, Google search ads to to Amazon to an Amazon property from your from your company you know AdWords account. Uh, well, yes, you can you can do that, and oh. um, and and also you can promote your listings organically. Like that, nothing really stops you from building links to your Amazon listing True. instead of building links to, to your, your website, you know, to your... website homepage. And and yeah. we we see a lot of people doing this. Because you know Amazon is one of the most authoritative domains in the world. The they rank king. for you know a huge, huge amount of different keywords. Mm. So it's it's sort of easier to promote Amazon listing than your own uh, website. Sometimes That's... now you may not necessarily want to do this for everything, mm. but for something very competitive, like you know, I, I I for example know that I cannot rank for you know keyword headphones or even, you know, um, wireless headphones, or even something more, ni- more, more niche and more specific. You know, those, those things are extremely competitive. But my Amazon listing can, I mean, if, if, if you look at this, uh, some, of, some of the top uh, Amazon listings that rank for those keywords, they don't even have that many links, like, you know, 10, 20. I can build 10, 20 links easily. So, mm-hmm. so that's, I think, what, uh, what we see a lot. And and also for some keywords, some niche keywords right now, we're starting to see uh, even new approach emerging where uh, direct-to-consumer brands pretty much own the whole SERP. And it's kind of starts with them. So they start with promoting their uh, Amazon listing. And then maybe they have a couple other listings like eBay listing. Mm-hmm. And then they promote a review website that uh, that talks about their headphones versus other headphones mm-hmm. and and they and, and they they also promote their youtube videos with, with re, uh, yet again headphones reviews and so on but for some keywords i, I was able to find serbs that are completely dominated uh, by brand. by certain brands yeah mm-hmm. super super interesting um another another thing we've preached on this show um, has been like the number one SEO metric to, to, um, and you know, this is controversial by the way, the number one SEO metric to, to optimize for is brand name search. And um, the, the theory there is like, um, if more people are searching for your brand, um, you know, you, the, the idea is that more, if you're selling headphones, for instance, more people sh- should search for your name eventually than headphones um 
and the theory is pretty much just just dominance. You look at um, you know sites like Boohoo.com or Fashion Nova um, are in are in like fashion in fashion you know uh, in fashion e-commerce, and um, none of the terms they 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 rank for things like you know dresses, party dresses, what have you, but none of those terms are as big as their brand name, essentially when you sort of put their domain up in SEM Rush, you just see uh, their brand. And then that's how you know that they dominate that space. Do you, do you agree or not? <laughs> I, I, I absolutely agree. I think, um, you know, when people search for headphones, that means they're in a very, very early stage of their journey. So, so you need to be there somehow, but, but you, you, you should not expect that people will just click and buy your, your headphones. People, people search for general terms but when they're looking for information. So they kind of tell, I'm in the market to buy something that I haven't made any decision. Once they make a decision, yeah, they will search for uh, the specific brand. And before they buy it, they will search for reviews. So yes, if you, if you have a lot of searches for brand, that's, that's a very, very good sign. Now the problem is how to get there because you, you don't get to this by doing like, uh, you know, just search engine optimization. You need to write a lot of content. You need to work with other people to write a lot of content. You need to be present in very you know, many, many places. And, uh, and that's sort of more than more of an art than science. There is no playbook that works for everyone, but brand search is extremely important uh, you know, from many points of view. Uh, it's it's a good indicator. It's kind of what, what what you should aim for that more people find you by searching for the brand. But it's also um, you know the way I think about brand search. Uh, it's it's my home. It's it's my new homepage. More people visit me through uh, my brand search than um, than than just go directly to my website. Sometimes I mean for for SEM Rush it's not the case. Uh, but but we have been around for for uh, you know more than ten years, so so people remember how to type in our name. But but still, we have hundreds of thousands of people who just search us in Google and then go to our website. What's even uh, more interesting? A lot of people now use Google as navigation, so they will type in SEM Rush and something that they're looking for in Google, and and then click on specific uh, part of the website that they want to visit. And from this point of view, if people actually use Google to navigate technically your website, then it's extremely important like uh, to understand how you work with it, how do you prioritize links uh, within your website towards uh, what people should see. And, and what's really good is that you can actually influence those things. Yeah. So because this, this is mostly about how you, how you push content, how you do internal linking. Yeah. Um, so, so that's what fascinates me. And, and we, we have a lot of those you know, use cases. As, as the website get big, it's, it's very natural for people to use uh, Google just to find stuff on your website. You're, not, you're never going to have search of a quality uh, that Google can provide to end mm -hmm. consumer. So, so thinking that, you know, I'll have this, this search bar on my website and people, you know, they, they, they would not because this thing doesn't work usually. Yeah. And, and, and what, what some other people prefer, and, and, I, uh, and I support this is when, you know, um, you, you've, you've got that volume of people searching for your brand, it becomes naturally easier for you to sort of rank for, for other, you know, more generic keywords um, because you just have that authority. Google knows somehow that, um, there's some value. I mean, if like you, Google knows the competitors in this environment and Google knows, okay, this particular brand has a million people searching for it, for it as compared to this other brand that has 200,000. So more people are interested. And so whatever this 1 million brand name search brand is optimizing for should be in most cases, more important than what people are looking for that 200,000 brand, unless that 200,000 brand name brand, um, sorry, unless that 200,000, you know, um, brand name search brand um, is very specialist and then it could own that category. Um, it, it has no way of competing against the, the 1 million if they do their SEO right, if they have the right SEO, you know, team. I'm just looking at Fashion Nova, for instance. Fashion Nova has 4.2. 0.9 million, 4.1 million searches a month on Google for just their brand name. 
And then they have other variants like Fashion Over. Um, the other variants are like another 500,000, 4.5 million people search for this brand. And their next generic term is Lingerie. And there are only 670,000 people searching for Lingerie. They rank for number two. Oh, sorry, number three for, for Lingerie. Um, so by the way, I'm, I'm in an SEM Rush account right now, um, which, yeah. So it's just interesting that most of the, the hugest volume terms here um, is, is just fashion over. You know, um, it's, it's their brand name. And then, you know, a number 10 or so, you, you then have, um, you know, a, a more generic term, which is interesting. Yeah, and you know the, the the same goes about about niches. So, you know, in terms of what, you know, in, when you start thinking what keywords make money, then niche keywords make more money than those generic keywords because mm. um, you know, as, as I said, people people search for headphones only when they don't know what headphones they want to buy. Yeah, exactly. And then at some point they say, okay, I, I want a wireless headphones. Okay, I, I, I want a wireless over the year. And, and the closer it gets, you know, the longer your keyword gets um, to, um, you know, the closer it's to conversion, the longer it is, is your keywords. So, so you're getting more money from long tail keywords than from generic keywords. And, and that's yeah. actually very surprising because many, many people, they just have this, you know, I, I want to rank for, uh, you know, headphones or and you know in our case would be you know, I want to rank for SEO. Well we could rank for SEO but it doesn't would it wouldn't bring a lot of money because uh, people who are searching for SEO they don't know SEO. They they, yeah. they maybe need courses. Maybe we should rank courses for this, but not yeah. SEM Rush main website. There's intent, you know, with with along with a very specific, you know, keywords. Okay. Um I want to, you know, we, we're talking today, we're still in the month of May, 2020. Um, we, the COVID crisis in, in many countries um, is starting to flatten. In some countries, they're still, you know, peaking out. Um, what has been your experience out in SEM Rush um, around um, coronavirus, um, you know, over this past two, three months? So I think, you know, we, we see um, that, the very consistent picture with what other SaaS vendors reported, you know, and we we've been through the first sort of wave of earning earnings calls. So a lot of publicly traded company had to disclose uh, certain information. I think, but what we see within our user base is very consistent. Um, I think in general for uh, SaaS companies that focus on online visibility and digital presence, uh, it's, um, you know, it's not not cool to say those, but I think it will be even sort of net positive, in a way that this this whole thing will accelerate digital transformation exactly. uh, more and more. You know, e-commerce is all our e-commerce are, are golden right now. So, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. um, you know, Zoom and and communication companies the same thing. They they Shop, you know, Shopify. 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 <laughs> you know, um, it's it's been the golden child here. Um, it's it's fascinating, yeah. and then. In SEM Rush, um, uh, you know um, the reaction from from the data. You guys, you know, you're a data company essentially. Um, so from the data you have privy to at at a very top level standpoint, um, how have you seen um, on on the one hand consumers react to COVID from a search volume perspective? Um, have you seen you know a, a spike in search volume from your data, and and also um, what kind of reactions if you have you know um, privy to have you seen like e-tailers and e-commerce? How have they reacted? Have they been more like, you know, brand name search volumes to, to um, e-tailers or um, more for products? Um, do, do you have any, you know, data to, to give us a perspective of what has happened in the last two months? Yeah. So we, we don't, we don't see, um, uh, I mean, we, we, we do see the difference between brand and non-brand, but I wouldn't be able to give you, the number from top of my head. In general, we see increases in traffic across all product categories, almost all. There are very, very few product categories like, um, like, let's say, uh, cocktail dresses. So yeah, people people buy not a lot of them, but yeah, most of, most of product categories went up uh, uh, in terms of traffic. In terms of CPC, they also slightly even went up. 
um, but only slightly because uh, the, let's say, amount of time that people spend online also increased. So, so your CPC is usually a function of, you know, how many, how many searches people are running, how much time people spend online. And then in, in this case, demand for certain ads went up and uh, also at the same time, amount of time went up. So, so CPC is increased only marginally. Um, and then, you know, some categories actually, you know, not, not doing great, but, but it, yet again, the question is if you consider them e-commerce, but, you know, ob obviously travel websites are in a bad shape, you know, uh, for us, um, uh, car rentals always have been a very good group of customers. They're mostly online from acquisition point of view. Yeah. They, they in a very bad shape. Uh, some of them started, you know, filing for bankruptcies, but I think, I think overall for e, for e-commerce, it's, it's even, you know, it's even yet again, I don't want to say words like positive because not, nothing in this whole thing is positive, but if we, if we need to find, you know, um, something good when, when, you know, in times of crisis, then um, I would say f this will completely change how people think about buying groceries. Yeah. So, which, which was huge, huge product category in terms of uh, turnover that people always felt, you know, I, I'll, j I'll just go and buy, you know, milk in, in my shop. Even, even e-commerce companies who had food brands, we, we always talked to them and they, they were like, yeah, we, we, we're not going to do fresh. We're not going to do uh, many other things. You know, we, we'll do, you know, food supplements, you know, things that can, can be stored. And, and now it changes like people, because people will buy anything online uh, instead of going to the you know, supermarket. And I think that's, you know, opens uh, tons and tons of opportunities uh, to, uh, to, to food e-commerce, which we, and those opportunities kind of didn't exist. Exactly. Um, and uh, exactly. I mean, consumer behavior certainly, you know, changed. And, um, and I think as long as this stretches, um, there's the potential for a lot of these habits to stick longer term. And, and so, you know, that share of e-commerce, this most likely like what SARS did, did in 2003 to China um, is likely just going to accelerate, um, you know, e-commerce. And as you alluded to digital transformation from an organizational standpoint, um, even in the employment market, um, a lot of people um, by default, if anyone's looking for a job now, um, it is going to be remote working. And, you know, back in the days, it was more or less a filter. So they'd apply for a job and then they'd look through a listing and then filter through, you know, who allows remote working. But now it's a default, you know, if, if you're in, in the gig economy, I guess. Um, you, you just, uh, there's, you know, everybody has to work from home, right? Um, which is super interesting. I, I think this, this one trend in particular will stick uh, because this right now this is an expectation like uh if you if you hire new people by default they start working remote and they expect that this will sort of continue uh, uh that will be very very good for many markets that historically experienced lower um salary rates even though quality of the talent was always exceptional yeah. um you know many european markets uh for for r d um because, you know, if, if, if you're Facebook and, and you don't expect people to show, on, show up in your office anyway, um, then why don't hire someone from, uh, you know, Europe if they, if they can work your, your hours um, you yeah. know, to compensate for time? So what's, what's the problem? I mean, yeah. so, so, yeah, I think that will be, uh, you know, very, very positive to people in uh, – you know, in, in other countries, um, but also for, um, for certain parts of the United States, um, because, you know, this the same thing exists in the United States. There, there is, you know, California and Boston and New York, and then throughout all other, all other places where, where engineers don't get this, this type of salaries that they could get in so, California. And yeah. for many people, you know, moving moving to california is just not really an option i mean there are families they have families they 
they have kids that go to school, they don't want to move just because, I don't know, there is, there is no Facebook in their hometown. So I think that will be good for you know, local communities as well. Um, because because now, now people can make, uh, you, know, so, you know, at least knowledge workers, right? Yeah, they yeah. can make yeah. good, life, well, good, good life without leaving their, their hometowns. So, um, you know, it's, um, yet again, I'm trying to find as, as much positives in, in this whole situation as, as possible. And I think, I think it's, um, there are quite a lot of them, to be honest. But, yeah. you know, the, the question is at what cost. And, you know. Yeah, and, and I'm sure um, we'll learn also from an, from an, eco, from, uh, from an ecological standpoint um, in terms of, you know, our carbon footprint and the need to travel and, you know, move around, you know, that often. So we'll see how things go. <laughs> we'll see how things go. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Eugene. Um, I think this 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 has been quite a, a thorough, um, you know, conversation. Um, but if you have any parting words on your expectations um, in um, the world of um, you know SEO um, and e-commerce, um, yeah, please please share 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 them with the audience. Yeah, I think. The way we think about SEO and, and, and keyword research and many other things is this is the voice of consumer. People searching for something because they need. So by, by doing keyword research, you're not you know, trying to do something artificial. You're not trying to manipulate the system. Right? You just listen for the voice of your consumer and, and trying to adjust your message and your product lines uh, towards this voice. And, and I think that's the most important part you know, to keep customer first. And, and that, you know, works almost all the time. If, if you're consistent, if you put customer first, eventually you will find the right, uh, you know, product market fit and, um, and uh, find your success. Interesting. Super customer first, customer centric centricity. Okay. So guys, um, you know, um, yeah, thank you for, for, for tuning in. For those who are listening up to this point um, in time, um, the best way to check out SEM Rush or to trial it, um, I think you guys have like a seven day trial um, at SEM Rush, um, would be just to go to semrush.com and you know, give it a shot. Um, I've used it for years. Um, and you know, I'm not saying this off the back of uh, you know getting anything off the back of that. Just it's just a solid platform essentially. It's a utility right now if you know you're into AdWords or or Google um, so SEO. Um, so so yeah, thank you again, and yeah, we'll catch you guys on on the next show.